Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sense Think Acts podcast. I'm the host, Audro Nash. And in today's episode, I interview Ryan Garapi, Chief Technology Officer of ClearPath Robotics. ClearPath Robotics makes several mobile robotics platforms that are used by researchers and corporations. We talk about the origin of ClearPath Robotics, how they have focused on making extremely robust robots, how ClearPath uses ROS1 and ROS2, and on the future of robotics. I thought it was very interesting to see how ClearPath as a company has matured with expectations in the robotics industry. And I really enjoyed hearing what Ryan thinks will be the future of robotics in the next two to five years. As always, a big thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, so to start, I would love to have you just introduce yourself and tell us a bit about ClearPath too. Of course. So my name is Ryan Garaby. I'm the CTO and co-founder of ClearPath Robotics, and I have been stuck in my office for about a year and a half and counting. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, so tell me a bit more about ClearPath. What's the kind of mission that you guys are going for and how, how long has the company been around? ClearPath's been around for just over 12 years, probably 12 years, 12 years, one month, and uh, 21 days, I believe, as of today. 21 and days. Something like that. The, <laughs> we started, we started as, as the company with an intent to be the company to go to when you had a robotics problem and you didn't know where to go to solve it, where you had ideas on a problem that you thought you could solve with robots, but you weren't quite sure. You weren't. You didn't know where to go, um, and it, it it wasn't necessarily a consultancy. It was about building some of these products, these baseline products and hardware and software, because it didn't exist at the time. And that's certainly been the case. Uh, we we have uh, seen the robotics market grow beyond our wildest dreams. And six years ago, we also started a a sister company called Auto Motors, um, which is a more vertically integrated supplier of production grade autonomous material uh, autonomous mobile robots to the materials handling industry and that's also been exciting we've we've actually driven you know millions and millions of hours unsupervised fully autonomous on that side of the business which i'm sure for all of the roboticists listening out there they they appreciate the challenges in, inherent in that mm -hmm. okay so you started clearpath wanting it to be for solving general robotics problems. How did you approach like that? How did you approach making it so you could solve general robotics problems? Well, when we were started or when we, when we got started, there was no standard way to build a robot or no standard way to build software. Anyone doing research, whether it's theoretical, very academic research, or applications level industrial research, or you know, government research, you were always building everything from scratch. Um, the hardware, obviously, but also all of the software. Right? Um, there, there was open source robotic software, but it, it wasn't really well used. And we wanted to be that company where you could go to and describe your problem, whether it's the research, the research problems, or the application you were trying to investigate and that we would help you move forward without having to build your own expertise in robotics from the ground up before you even started. You want, you know, researchers want to research or, or entrepreneurs want to want to test ideas. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be caught up in a year of learning how to build a robot before they even get started on what their idea is. It's, it's demoralizing and frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so ClearPath, you guys have a bunch of general platforms effectively that people can build off of for their different applications like on different yeah. surfaces and things yeah we we started we started in the outdoor space um, and that was because we'd realized and this this was you know back in 2008 2009 we'd realized that outdoors was where the really valuable use cases were going to start appearing um, where the, the new valuable use cases were going to start appearing at least. And that's where the research was being done. 
And on top of it, on top of that, the on top of that, there was a lot of recent progress around things like sensors. For example, when I started my undergraduate degree, it cost probably three thousand dollars to buy a an, an IMU, which was which was half decent, which could tell you basically which way was up. And then through the end of my under, end of my undergraduate, it was you know thirty bucks. Now lidars were still blindingly expensive at the time, but we were starting to see those prices drop. We, for example, the the URG04, which was the first really affordable navigation grade lidar, you know, small one about that big, that that appeared through the end of my, if I recall correctly, through the through the end of my undergraduate time. So we were starting to see this significant drop in sensors as well as a significant increase in. Uh, in the power capabilities of the robots. So now off-road was all of a sudden possible and it was this brand new space in research. Just for scale, how, how much do you think you could get a comparable IMU or inertial measurement unit for today? Um, like the same quality, would it be like, I guess it'd be like 10 bucks or something or what do you think it would be? Far I mean, at volume, far, far, far cheaper, far cheaper. The, the most expensive part these days would be the engineering effort to stick it on the PCB. <laughs> That's crazy. Like be, between the IMU, between the IMUs themselves, and all of the filtering software that now exists, and the processing software that now exists, like your cell phone is probably better than those first IMUs we were using. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. And then, so outdoor, how, how did you identify that most, or that there was a lot of potential interesting things um, for outdoor robotics applications? Like, what were you looking at? Well, I guess? Yeah, if we start from the research space, it was because there just weren't any research platforms out there, or just there, there weren't many. There were very, very few research platforms out there which could handle a reasonable outdoor terrain. There was a lot of indoor platforms, like we're, you know, there was a bunch, still a bunch of old like RWI indoor platforms around. There was uh, is the ones RWI, that were actually is, built. Is that a company or what it, was, it was? Yeah, gotcha. that was real world interface. Um, ah, okay. And uh, you had, uh, you know, the at the time it was Mobile Robots, then became Adept Mobile Robots, and is now Omron. But um, you had there the Pioneer three three uh, DX was a very very much a workhorse. Um, you had people who were hacking uh, Roombas around, and and the first Create was being used. But these were all indoor platforms, and the researchers there were obvious there were obviously there was outdoor research happening, right? Like the CMU Robotics Institute was you know, had been doing outdoor robotics research for, for decades, but it wasn't a very common thing. Um, and we, that's where we said is that's where we were going to get started. That's where we we're going to make our mark by building these really solid robots that could unlock entirely brand new fields of field robotics work. That's really where we got started. It's almost ironic that auto is that when we started auto, it's almost entirely focused on indoors, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that is funny. Okay. So you were working on these platforms and just, uh, can you give me a sense of what they look like overall? Like a, a lot of the platforms that are used for outdoor use, um, what do they look like? You know, generally most of the platforms we have, they're, they're black and yellow and they have four <laughs> wheels. Yeah. Um, and so it's if you're seeing one of those in research, it's probably one of ours. <laughs> yeah. And they, um, so they mostly, they, it's like a big flat spot on the top where you can attach different things that you might, more cameras, more, more anything else. Yeah, right? yeah, that was generally it. We wanted to build, I mean, we knew that the, the software space in robotics wasn't quite ready for the software platform yet, but we knew the world was ready for physical platforms and we took that somewhat literally. So building some big, like, so yes. Software platform? What do you mean? The world wasn't ready. Uh, well, for by it. software platform, I would mean something you know, like the iPhone, where you have um, you can write software, right? You don't need to change any hardware. Um, we're now at the we're now further along that curve, but yeah, we we try to make it really easy for us to integrate things. We try to make it um, easy for our customers to integrate things. The sort of robots that if you decided that you're in the field and something needed to work, and you could take a hammer to it, you could take a drill to it, that it would work. You could. You know, pack it together and get it out and do your research and get it back in the field. We, we to the point where we would, I don't know if we we still sell these, but we would sell replacement top plates only for when someone <laughs> just wanted to, you know, drill and tap the top plate for mm -hmm. some research gear and then 
Later, they realize either they made a mistake or they really like it. And you could take the top plate with all your sensors. You could put it on the shelf and you could you could share the asset around, right? That's that's That was actually a very, uh, well, it, it's still a really common thing now that you have self-driving vehicles where you would get a, you'd have a dozen researchers, but only one physical robot, right? Because you could only afford one, one sensor setup. Now there's research labs where you can have things like, you'll have things ranging from, you know, the TurtleBot 3 all the way up to like our, our Warthog and Moose platforms, for example, which are on the larger <laughs> size. Um, yes. But it was, it was very much like, well, you know, at the time you had the PR2 robots in the mm-hmm. field and there you'd have an entire research lab, which was around those PR2s. But even for the labs, which couldn't afford that, they were still buy, they would buy like our Husky platform, which was our first and actually one of the most iconic platforms we make. And you'd have to share it, right? You have this, this little robot, it's got a bunch of sensors, you need to share it among all your students. Mm-hmm. That is nice. It's clever to just replace the top plate. That seems like a good solution. So let's see, are there any particularly interesting applications? Mean, I'm sure that people are using your platforms for tons of things, but are there any that were like, particularly interesting or surprising uses? Well, if, if I go outside the, if I, if I ignore some of the confidential stuff, there's yeah. <laughs> the, the, the one which I saw most recently, which, which surprised me. And I didn't, I didn't actually know about this one until I saw it in the news, but was a, a college which was using the, the Boxer, which is a industrial autonomous ro- mobile robot that clear path sells, which is actually a variant of the auto AMR. Um, so it's a, about a hundred kilos, a hundred kilos built like it can survive a factory because it can. And it was used, um, it was being used for robotics or applications research at St. Clair College, I believe. Um, but recently, obviously people have needed to do all sorts of you know, working remotely, schooling remotely, and what have you, and they rigged it up as a uh, they made rigged it up as a moving clothes horse or clothes or like clothing model, for lack of a better term, where they had a fashion they have a fashion program at the school, <laughs> and it was very important for them to see to see how the clothes would move, um, like <laughs> like how they would drape when they would move, and they get the. Uh, and, and it's like, you can't, you're, you're doing all this judging and exhibiting remotely and you can't, you, you're not just going to set them all up in mannequins and leave it like that and have the judges look at it. So they would actually swap out these, um, I can't exactly remember how they, how they held the clothes on top of the robot, if it was a mannequin or a mannequin or something else, but they would, they would swap them out and, and run the fashion show like that. I thought that was just you know, that was really, really interesting. I mean, everyone hears about everyone hears about the disinfection robots that people built in the last year. Like, I don't know how many have been built on our platform, but everyone hears about those. But you never hear about these these little like the yes, the the clothes modeling robot. That's hilarious. What a great use. Hell yeah. Um, okay, and then one thing that's been very interesting to me from your previous talks and things. Um your robots, they're designed to be super reliable, like go forever. Can you talk a bit about this? From the, from the beginning, we would, uh, we would joke with our, with our prospects that, that the reliability stand, standard for our robots is, is outlast the researchers. Um, so that, that, was the, that was the idea, um, even at the ClearPath Clear robotics side of things, where the, the standards are not as high as on the, on the industrial front. But that was the goal. It was you should never have to you should never have to cut short your field robotics research because of, well, frankly, bad weather. And I, I think that comes from that comes from us all um, us all being Canadian or all the early the, all the founders <laughs> and the early employees all being Canadian. Is that when you're out there testing your robots, like one half of the effective school year, the winter term, it's it's a lot of slow. And when the snow leaves, it gets replaced by mud. So we really wanted to not get in the way and not have to worry about, not have to worry about um, the snow or not have to worry about the rain. So that was that was our initial standard. Um, and then we've kept pushing from there. And this was a, a very interesting time for robotics because the this we were able to mature along with the market expectations. 
Mm. These days, if you're starting a robotics company, it's just got to work. Like, you know, you're compared against, you know, robots like, like ours or fetches as they are now. You're not compared against the robots that we had uh, 10 years ago, but that's, that's what the market does. Yeah, it matures. That is interesting. Huh. So it's really changed as the market has grown and people expect a product now. What do you guys do differently um, to make it so that your robots are even more reliable than they were in the past, which was still super reliable? The thing that's really helped is the fact that the rest of the world has now caught on to the potential and power of robotics. So it means that it's easier for us to build partnerships with other companies who have a lot of some of the, who have some of this fundamental expertise, like sensors, sensors or actuators or simulation systems. And I think that's been, that's been really helpful. So even a lot of the larger robots, for example, that ClearPath Robotics sells are, are built in partnership with vehicle suppliers. Um, so we're the robotics experts, but we actually work with other vehicle experts. Or, or even more recently, um, more recently, it was very you know well covered in the robotics media that we did a we're doing a we have rather a partnership with with Boston Dynamics for the research space, and that just makes sense, right? Boston Dynamics is is one of the leading, if not the leading, manufacturer of legged robots in the world, and we're the world's leading integrator and solver of these problems. So it was it, it just made sense that that our clients in the world needed more legged robots and now that that's possible and why would we try to do that ourselves right work with the yeah, companies who've already picked it up yeah interesting so going back to working with the vehicle uh companies so do you take advantage of their existing supply chain and their existing processes or Absolutely. how does that work ah yeah where, where, yeah no oh, they go ahead. in some cases the vehicle in some cases the vehicle shows up like at our door where it's been a repurposed vehicle where they've remanufactured parts of it. And then we will take it and turn it from, you know, a, what might be described as a giant remote control car into this <laughs> Ross enabled, fully integrated uh, research platform, uh, you know, upgraded power systems, upgraded power systems, onboard compute, all of the sensor options that we might have. Um, all of the customization options that we've got. So just like early days, you could call us up, you know, 10 years ago and say that my research, hypothetically, my research is in, you know, mobile manipulation and unknown environments. And we would turn around and say, okay, well, maybe if your budget is X, then you can't do the 3D LIDAR, but you can get an arm like this and you can get a camera. We've got that same, uh, we've got that same, that same, what's it called experience for, for everything else we do. It's really about providing like, I, and I said this at a, at a conference, one of the last conferences I was actually able to speak at in person yeah. that are, we, we do have very reliable robots, but in the end, what we, what we sell is, is the ability to speed up the robotics development cycle. Mm, definitely. Gotcha. And just out of curiosity, where are most of the manufacturers that actually build the robots you guys make? There's a lot we work with in, well, in Ontario. Ontario has a lot of uh, vehicle manufacturers. We've been, wow. we've been broadening that. So traditionally, um, we've been very heavy on still building our own vehicles. Um, and where we've really got the broadest reach will be in the manipulation and sensing spaces because those markets have been more mature for a while. Um, and those, and those you can really, you can imagine the countries in particular, like, you know, Germany and Japan are the two probably largest companies on, on those fronts, but that's probably not a surprise to anyone. You know, America, um, Denmark, I mean, you are, we were, we had, we worked with uh, universal robots on a custom skew for ourselves and our clients, I don't know custom how many skew? years ago this was. What do you mean? Oh, sorry, a stock keeping unit. Um, it's a um, sort of custom configuration of their arm. So you're typically when you bought a, a universal robot arm, you needed to and you wanted to do research with it. The universal robot arm would have you'd have the arm, and then you would have a, a controls box, which is a giant controls box meant for industrial, well at least decent size, meant for industrial floors, 
and it had three boards in it. It had an, a power supply board, which was effectively a, you know, transformer and step down or, you know, well, you know, recti rectifier and step down transformer. And yep. so getting the power ready for the arm, safety, basically. Yeah. Power yep. regulator. Yeah. Then you'd have a, a safety, a safety board and a controller board. And of that, you have this giant enclosure and a big power supply. But it turns out that most of our large vehicles supply the power, already supply the power at the spec needed because they have a big DC, they have a big DC bus Battery. on them for power. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to in integrate a mobile or a uh, UR robot onto a mobile robot, you would have to put in a, an inverter like, or, um, you would you would need an inverter to go up to AC, and then you would end up what would end up happening inside this black box, which was also kind of large, was that then then it would end up losing more power because you were just stepping it all the way down to DC. So we had a arrangement so with DC them where we could to AC and then back to DC and then back to DC, right? Which is generally yep. a waste. Yep. So it's waste of power, waste of space. And and just extra cost. So we came to an agreement with them where we would we would you know buy the arms and buy the two boards, and then we would mount them ourselves. And where you used to have this this just huge package, that package was no longer there because we could mount the components inside of inside of the the chassis itself, and that was great. So that that was the sort of partnerships which we were always forging, which was to open up these brand new markets for these partners. And you know, serve our customers oh, really better at cool. the same time because, like, we're already got we've already got our hands full building the bases. We're not going to build the arms too. Yeah. So you you said that you guys kind of your core competence would be like as an integrator, if I understood correctly, of um, basically taking the platform and then adding pieces to it so that the robotics community or anyone who wanted to do something with a robot could use it, right? More and more, uh, more and more so. I mean, we're we're very good at vehicle design, yep. but you know we have been. There's just now that the world is picking up these, you know, now that the world is is really engaging with the robotic space and the automation space, it's it's just there's just more demand than we can almost deal with. Like it's it's one thing to maintain a vehicle demand, like a vehicle portfolio of a half dozen to a dozen vehicles, which is what we have, uh, and we're proud of every single one of them, but there's so many different opportunities out there that we've had to, uh, we've had to really partner in order to keep everyone, uh, keep growing, know, to keep focused on what we're good at. Right? Yeah. And then, then, so in this role, um, it's a lot of taking an existing platform and you retrofit it with components and software, or how, how would you think of that? Like, what do you do when you get a new platform? Or it's probably quite case by case, but. Yeah, it's very case by case. I mean, you, you, we don't just, we don't usually just, you know, buy some random, some like, I don't know, buy a car off the lot and customize it. We, we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we can provide this continual, this continual solution for people, which means that we'll, we'll usually have already spoken to the manufacturer. We've, we've come to some kind of agreement with them. The, you know, the degree of which is, is always case by case, but we're not trying to guess at things, right? We don't want to, we don't want to do, do something a little bit renegade where, you know, you, you buy a, you know, you buy an ATV off the lot and then you kind of hope it works because the customers, the customers expect it to be maintainable and for, you know, spare parts to be available. That's, that's the other reason why people will, uh, who work with us is because when all of their grad students have left or when their research projects have gone on to, to production, those robots will still be there. And they want to, they want the next set of researchers and the next set of robotics developers to be able to, to just, you know, jump Keep on board. On. For yeah. sure. Now you mentioned um, how customers come to you with problems and then kind of, you see if you can find something that fits them. How has that changed um, while you've grown over the last 12 years? The problems are a lot more, um, the problems are a lot more uh, diverse in what people are looking for. Mannequins. Um, the, yeah. The, 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 that one, well, that one, that one was good. We didn't they even did. know about that one. They just, yep. they just did it. Um, but 
I, on the plus side, I think there is a growing appreciation for a growing appreciation for what robots can and can't do, right? Like when we started the, even the concept of a drone that you could just casually buy, it wasn't a thing. Um, one of the, uh, the, the company, I, a company I internship, uh, I interned at was called Arion Labs and they've just been purchased by FLIR and they, they sold drones for first responders. And at the time that they had started, you couldn't buy an autonomous drone or autonomous quadcopter. There, there was, there was no money that you could pay to the market, which would get you a reliable autonomous quadcopter short of funding an entire robotics company yourself. So that was, that was where we were. Right. And self-driving cars, you know, the, the urban challenge was, was just one at the time. I can't even remember what year the, the urban challenge was, but that was just around that time frame. like autonomous cars weren't a thing. So there was still a little bit of a sense of robots could either do nothing or they could do everything. So early on, there was a lot more need to reset expectations. And on top of that, there was, what, what on top of mean, that, or for the reset resetting. Yeah. Um, so you're saying people would either think they could do everything or nothing kind of thing, like useless, yeah. or they will just be the Jetsons butler kind of thing? Effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And so bring people down to the level that robots actually can do um, and kind of show them how they can be useful still with what they have. Or is that what well, you that's, mean that's that? where we are right now, right? Like you can <clears throat> in when, when we had when we were starting, you know, there, there would be there were probably a few thousand people in the world who knew who could reasonably describe the state of the self-driving vehicle market, like where the, the technology readiness level of the self-driving vehicle market. Mm -hmm. But now I would charitably guess that there are millions of people on earth who can generally describe what a self-driving vehicle is and, and isn't. They know what it is and they know it's not taking you to Starbucks anytime soon without a, a well-paid test driver in the front or you still paying attention. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's, that's not how it was. So you'd have, you'd either be, you know, selling to someone because you knew there's an opportunity there and they didn't really think that it was possible or they would come to you with an opportunity. Now, this is beyond the researchers. This is when the commercial demand started to take an uptake, but you'd have people coming in and saying, yeah, like, can I pay, you know, $5,000 to automate my old clunky gas powered lawnmower and have it run completely unsupervised through the middle of a park in a crowded day? Um, there was a lot more requests like that. Mm. Um, there are still, and just to be clear, there are still requests like that, but they are, but there are far more requests where the people who come in the door are already conditioned and already educated about what robots can and can't do. And I think that's, Ooh, that's, that's just wonderful for everybody, right? Like that's saves everyone a whole lot of time. And so if you're getting requests like that, where they're um, coming in and asking if this is possible and how much it would be, that means that you guys have to be extremely knowledgeable about the state of the art in probably a lot of different areas. Because, I mean, there's the hardware, there's the software component and then all the specific things, um, I don't know, sensors, how to estimate things. It, like you guys kind of have to be broadly competent in a lot of robotics. Yes. Fields. Yeah. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, but the, the thing that gives us, that's been interesting. Uh, well, and I'll speaking for me personally, and it's one of the reasons I, I love this work so much is because every day there's a new, there's some new development out in the world in the robotic space. That's going to make, that's going to make a new application possible. Or it's a new technology. And like every day there's something new that I'm, I, that I can learn. Like I just actually right before this, I was I was reading a paper, a uh, reading a paper put together that's that's um, I don't know if it's been accepted or if it's in final submissions for IROS, which is a big robotics conference, and it's it's authored by people who work for ClearPath. That's that's just great. And I was reading through the paper and realizing that my math has really gone down the drain. But <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, the the other thing, which I mean, it sounds kind of intimidating, which is like our job is to stay up to date with everything in the field, which is robotics at all times. But it's as, as odd as it sounds, it's not that challenging because we don't have to do any catch up. Like if you're starting a robotics company now, you have a lot of catching up to do. 
right? Like you have decades of progress and you have all sorts of, you know, labs to track. You, you need to know where to pay attention, who to pay attention to, which conferences to go to, like all of it. You need to catch up with the state of the art. And at that, as you're doing that, the state of the art's always changing. But, you know, we, we got to do that work before this, the field, before the, the, the robotics field really blew up. So now it's just, it's, it's day for day. Really. So you wrote, rode the wave basically, and now you're still on it, we, which is fantastic. We did. We're, we're just, we're just holding on now, but it's, it's a lot easier than, than, uh, than trying to catch it from nothing right now. How do you, do you structure your team with like experts in specific areas or is it a team of generalists or how do you, how would you think about it? Probably so our simple. team, yeah, we're, uh, the, the, the team as a whole, if, if you include the automotors, um, business unit, which is a large portion and, you know, shared services and everything like that. We're about uh, 200 to eight, 280 to 300 people. We're in there, that range right now. Are you all and in the Waterloo, Toronto area or where? No, do you, no. Do you have an office uh, in San Francisco? In the Bay, I believe? I, or? No, we, um, our offices, our physical offices, we have four facilities in, in the Kitchener-Waterloo region. So, if you know the area, there's one in Waterloo, there's two in Kitchener, and there's one on the near side of, of Cambridge. And everything else is everything else is remote work. And actually, a lot of that was like all of our sales team and a lot of our field team were remote before even the pandemic hit. We always had some, you know, engineers working remote here and there. But overall, um, you know, overall, Canada is probably. You know, if I, I don't know these numbers offhand, but I would guess 90 to 95 percent of the people that we have are, you know, live live in Canada, live in, you know, southwestern Ontario. And then though there's the next percentage, there'll be you know, a rounding error of people who are full time around the world. So there's someone who's in someone in Mexico right now. There's someone in Spain. Uh, we have a, a full time member of our team in Japan. And then everyone else, everyone else is in the U.S. So there's a lot of a lot of salespeople in the U.S., uh, field service techs, uh, systems engineers, people like that. Because um, there's a really obviously a big export market for us is uh, is autonomous systems into the U.S. So gotcha. And then um, for like, is it well, the specialized versus generalist approach? Oh yeah, How yeah, would you yeah. Think about that? There's so there's. There's probably about there's under 20 people at the company who you, who would have who had robotics experience before they joined us. That would be oh, my, wow. I guess that's crazy. Um, okay. So whether that's whether that's mobile robotics experience, like you know, AGV deployment in industry, or you know, a master's or a PhD, it's it's probably around that number. I know the the autonomy group in the auto space the uh, on the uh, the auto business unit has 14, I believe. 14 people that's all masters and phds doing various sorts of product development and research for example but beyond that we really try to bring in experts and experienced people in their fields whether that's you know operations manufacturing finance sales wherever um and, and then even in engineering like i have i think it's seven people who report to me right now uh not a single one not a single one started in the robotic space and only one of them had any experience in robotics before joining this. Wow. Um, so it, it really is. And, but people learn really quickly, right? Like, oh, yeah. because we've got this, this foundation, this, you know, foundation of technology. Um, mm -hmm. the, the analogy I often make is if you go to a, you know, you look at a company like Audi, for example, or, you know, any established high tech company, how many mm -hmm. people, go into that high tech company with expertise in that the thing that makes that high tech company special. Like how many people yeah. work at SpaceX and of those, how many are rocket scientists? Yep. Like how many That's people work at Audi and of those, how many people actually know how to build an engine, right? Like the <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely. That seems like something like as a result of the robotics field maturing, I feel like, like at the beginning, it was probably a lot more roboticists and now it's, people of other specializations that can contribute because it's large enough that they can focus on something that they have skills for. Yeah. Well, and that was actually a big thing for us when we decided to start getting into, uh, uh, getting into the, the industrial space in general was 
hiring people who weren't roboticists because you know this this has changed over the years but you know back when we were starting you know maybe 10 percent of roboticists could write any kind of decent code that you would want <laughs> running in a production application and i'm probably being i'm probably being uh generous there and that's not an <laughs> insult because i i don't think i'd count myself as one of those 10 percent um but when we started really going after the industrial market it was important to hire people who had written good software so mm -hmm. that's that's what we did. And these days, I'd say our ratio is for every person who writes, for every three people who write software, there is one roboticist and one tester. That's probably the rough ratio that we have. Gotcha. Very interesting. Let's see. So moving into software, um, you at ClearPath were some early adopters and supporter of the robot operating system. Ross, would you tell me a bit about that? We were. Yeah, um, I can still remember a lot of those discussions like they were yesterday. Um, <laughs> we, started, uh, we started the company formally in 2009. And at that point, we had the philosophy that there was always going to be more smart people outside of the company than inside of the company. That's that's almost like a statement of fact for any company, no matter how big. And we said we were going to start with um, we we're going to start with open source. And that was number one for that that general observation I just outlined. And the other one is that one of our largest competitors at the time really, really charged a lot of researchers money for this expensive autonomy package. Like if you wanted to buy a laser, you also needed to buy this really expensive autonomy package. And we did market surveys of the early early researchers to those people who were who participated in that 12 year 12 year old market survey thank you and almost <laughs> every one of them said they didn't like paying for the software because they were going to write it themselves anyway so wow. we said okay we will start with a uh, a small open source uh, software package called uh, player stage gazebo which was a well, it's a combination of three player um, which is, you can look at that as an equivalent to Ross, uh, Stage, which is a, a 2D simulation environment meant for multi-robot simulations, and Gazebo, which most people still know because it's still around. Yeah, um, simulation. And yeah, so we started play, with that. Player was then, a message passing precursor to Ross, right? Correct. With this kind yeah. of thing? Okay, so you started with those. We started with those. And then in, uh, in 2010, we went to our first official trade show. Uh, which was ICRA 2010 in the in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. Ah, and wow! Just say we'll just say that those trade shows are a lot flashier now. But we saw and met the uh, the crew from Willow Garage, and one of the things which was really interesting, and they they had their PR2 out, and they were doing all sorts of fancy stuff, and they're way way better funded than we ever were. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the the thing that really um, was impressive is that. If you've ever installed player stage, it's a bit of a challenge. And, and the Willow Garage team had put so much effort into making Ross not only just a good piece of software, but also well documented and easy to install. And it just seemed like the way to go. And we knew that people from the player stage community had gone over to be, you know, being supported by or were part of Willow Garage or being supported by Willow Garage, like Brian Gerke, first and foremost. And then, um, so we said, no, okay, this is going to be the way it's going to go, right? Th this is the only place which is actually funding not just some software, but the community around the software. So we basically turned at the drop of the hat and said, you know, probably that, that would have been April, May in 2010. And I was going back to, uh, uh, going back to, to Mike, who's our first engineer, um, first engineer at the company saying like, we need to, we need to start this supporting this Ross thing and starting to talk to our customers about it. So to the, to the best of my knowledge, we are the first company, we we're the first company in the world that probably made money off of, <laughs> off of something tied to Ross. Um, That's awesome. And that was the case for a very long time for years, a bunch of these other companies in the space were just hemming and hawing on like, do we need to support Ross? And that you could, you could get these other robots to be supported, but it was always some third party, some third party li uh, library written by a grad student who happened to have that robot in the shop <laughs> yeah. and liked Ross. Um, and these these days, and then you know things continue to progress from there. We have been talking, you know, early days about the um, 
you know, creation of at the time was called the Ross Foundation. That was the, uh, the name for it, but now you know it as the Open Source Robotics Foundation. So that got founded. Uh, I joined the board for that. Um, the TurtleBot, TurtleBot was an interesting story. So that, that was obviously created by, by Melanie Wise, um, you know, at Fetch, or I guess, well, they were just acquired. So congratulations to them. And, uh, and Tully Foote, who's still at the, uh, he's still with Open Robotics. And they created this TurtleBot thing, which is a really cool idea. And we had a, a smaller, a more extensible, but more extensive, uh, but more, far more expensive educational platform available at the time. And said, no, like this is, and the other thing that happened around the TurtleBot was that the Microsoft Connect came out. It was just the perfect sensor. Like that was the first commercially available RGBD sensor. So then the so camera this, and depth, uh, this kind of thing. camera yeah. and depth. Yes. And, and that meant that you never needed to worry about LiDAR, right? Like you didn't have to worry about the laser, at least for small scale stuff. So that was really cool. And it turns out that uh, Melanie and Tully were tired of putting turtle bots together by hand. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, <laughs> we had a conversation and ended up that we, we supplied Willow Garage with a ton of turtle bots and then became the first manufacturer, um, the first manufacturer of turtle bots in the world. I can't, I can't remember who else was there. There was, um, Bill Morris from the company, he has his own business called iHeart Robots or iHeart Engineering. I think it's changed between those names. And I think there was a, a third company at the time. I think they were there off in Europe, but I can't remember who it was. And it was like, that was like 10 years ago. But that was also a really interesting thing at the time that, you know, we decided we, we killed our own product because we figured the TurtleBot was going to gain momentum in it. It certainly did. Um, and then, yeah, other stuff around like uh, Roscon, I was... That was what 2012 was the first Roscon, so we helped we helped found that, um, and that's still going strong. I yep. literally right before the uh, right before the we got on this call here, I just finished my uh, I finished my my share of the reviews for Roscon uh, nice. Roscon 2021. So New Orleans mm -hmm. this year, New Orleans that'll be a blast. But it's it's been exciting, right? Like the Ross community was huge, or it's 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 just completely mind blowing the sort of things that we've seen here, like we, when, when you started, when we started, well, I guess when we started there, Ross wasn't out there, but even when we started supporting Ross, no manufacturer was out there supporting Ross and no, like every sensor that you needed to get into Ross, it was written by, you know, Willow Garage. It was written by us. It was written by some grad student halfway around the world. Like, but now, now you get a sensor or you get a robot from any reputable manufacturer and there's probably a Ross driver for it. I remember getting a new prototype sensor from a, we'll just say it's a well-known manufacturer and the only instructions on how to use the sensor was, was like install the package we gave you and it's Ross launched this. Yeah. And that was the instruction. <laughs> and, and, you know, previous to that, previous to that, like every sensor manufacturer had their own, their own usually Java implemented sensor oh. visualization package. Yeah. Some still do. And I, I don't blame them, but it's been this, that's the sort of thing which is really interesting is, you know, first they would go from what's Ross from, you know, they, they just didn't know what it was. They didn't care. And then later we would, you know, be trying to lean on them a little bit and say, well, if you want us to sell this new sensor, you have make it easier for us to build a Ross driver or like release your package online or do something like, you know, at that point, it's like you, I can, uh, I can almost guarantee you that your own engineers have a Ross driver if you go and ask them. So just put that on. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and now we're at the point where the sensors just they just come out of the box. You don't need to ask. And that's huge, right? Mm hmm Let's see. So and you used ROS for everything, connecting everything on your system, it's even early on. Is it true? Yeah. That's awesome. And so now how are you guys involved in the community with ROS? So you're obviously still a part of it. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, uh still on the uh still on the board, still running Roscon. Um, our ability to stay up to date with all the, the recent versions ebbs and flows. So I apologize to anyone in the community who is, or who, <laughs> when we get, a, when we caught a little, get caught a little bit behind the ball on whatever the recent release is. Um, all of the auto autonomy code is all, you know, based on Ross and uses the Ross middleware. It's on our fleet manager as well. Um, all of our inter fleet and robot comms on the, on the um, 
um, for auto, for our industrial AMRs or mobile robots, that's all ROS2 now. So we've started to, um, all the comms layer autos. Auto. Yeah, all the, the, so all the autos, all the autos talking to our fleet, our fleet manager, that's all based on ROS2 since, well, that's exciting. three, four years back. Yeah, we were the, um, to the best of my knowledge, we were one of the first people to actually use production or ROS2 in a production environment where, you know, if it failed, you would have angry phone calls. Um, it was, it, you know, it, it wasn't through the entire stack, right? Like our autonomy system is still very ROS1 based. Um, and that's just like a legacy thing. So we're talking about migration plans now. Um, but but we, we actually did a, an independent investigation when we needed to really scale up the amount of robots at a given factory. And we found that DDS was actually pretty good, um, that DDS was a good direction to go in. And we said, okay, well, if, we're, if DDS is, is what's coming out of this, then let's use ROS2. So we did that and it's, yeah, it's been great. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm looking, I always forget what DDS stands for. Um, for it's a this. data distribution service. Data distribution service. And it's a really, it's a flexible middleware that allows you to kind of interpolate between TCP, which is lossless, or not like it doesn't lose data and UDP, which can lose data, but um, useful for like walking robots and this kind of thing where you don't want to hold it up if you miss uh, data being sent. Well, over. yeah, so there's there's a bunch of stuff in there, which is just which was already implemented, right? Like quality of service, quality of service is a big thing. Um, some of the other stuff was just more of like how it was implemented. So, for example, um, with with ROS one, both um, the C plus plus language, the C plus plus language binary, or uh, the C plus plus library and the Python library, they both independently implemented the ROS one protocol. So it meant that it would like, um, so it, it meant that twice there was sometimes be these well twice as much to maintain, and then sometimes you had gotchas like especially early on where it's like oh that function and that function and subscribe well that only works if you use Python great well um, or vice versa and uh, so that was like another big change that went with ROS two was you know implementing everything at a you know implement implementing everything at a sing or the bindings on top of DDS at a single layer or a single language and then. And then building on top of that. And then the other thing that's nice about that is that now it does make it easier to notionally migrate to some newer libraries. Like I know Rust is being talked about a lot in the Rust community these days. Um, but yeah, there's there's all sorts of other you know little things. Like Rust One was really only built for a single very complicated robot, like one robot that's doing very complicated things, and specifically the PR two. Um, but then people started using it for fleets of robots really quickly. Um, or the other thing is that people wanted to people want to start running ROS on microcontrollers for obvious reasons, and it's it's far easier to shrink ROS two down. And then um, and I think yeah, I've, you know, well there there are definitely implementations of ROS two that can run on a microcontroller. I'm not sure how public they are. It's always difficult to remember that, so I won't mention any right now. Um, but yeah, you can you can fit like you can do a lot of ROS two on a microcontroller, which is now really interesting with the ROS one days you would have a package called uh, ROS serial for example which if you wanted to talk to an Arduino you need it you put this like lightweight serial protocol on the ROS or on the Arduino or you know any AVR chip and you would basically tell it that it was allowed to use these you know a few of these language or a few of these um, these message types but it wasn't really ROS um, so now we're able to do a lot more um, there's a lot more consideration as well for you know real-time the real-time nature of it, which opens up the door to, uh, which opens up the door to, you know, safety critical ROS, uh, safety critical ROS implementations, you know, hard real-time guarantees. There's all sorts of interesting stuff there. Um, I would say, I mean, and the, I, pardon? Would you talk a bit about the safety critical ROS? This kind of thing? Well, I, don't, I don't know too much about it. Right. Is, so, is, it, is it using so, standards around ROS where you, so you can guarantee some sort of performance? And if it's real time, you can deterministically say this is going to happen at this time, or we know that this task will complete and this kind of thing. The, the thing which is, so obviously there's various levels of, you know, safety of safety guarantees and up until now, and this is actually including including our products, for example, a lot of the safety happens at 
a lower layer under ROS, right? On the motor controllers or there's safety relays or there's safety PLCs or safety controllers programmed in, you know, some some safe RTOS or free RTOS or whatever. Um, and that's not, that's usually not in ROS. Now, obviously there are benefits in so many reasons, there are so many ways to not having to do that. And the nice thing is, so ROS2 on its own right now, you know, it's it's not certified. Um, it's not certified. It's not, you know, if you use everything there in what ROS, you you're going what to be able to certified? do things like uh, certified, like uh, like under a like a CE you know, standards agency of, um, of some sort, or yeah, Misra C um, language standards or C plus plus or like I, ISO two six two six two or IEC sixty one five zero eight. Like basically, if you love the standards libraries, then you you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, Do dash one seventy eight is the aerospace one. So, I mean, Ross Ross two on its own, because it supports by definition so many different languages, like or so many functions in full C, then it's not going to be certified on its own, right? Um, because you can do things with C, which are considered not standard. unsafe. If you're uh -huh. really, really trying to be specific, like and you're trying to write something that's you know safety rateable to very high levels, like you know, can run a nuclear power plant levels and and what have you then you need to avoid things like any kind of dynamic memory allocation ever and so obviously if you if you if the ross community built a tool set that didn't ever let you use any dynamic memory allocation then that would we'll just say not be adopted because there's a lot of places where that doesn't matter we actually build safety rated systems and we have We've made certain cho choices that optimize towards time to market at the expense of a little bit of extra cost on the safety system, right? But that means that we can use the full gamut of C++ or Python functions. Now, but there are companies and there are initiatives out there um, where they have been able to trim it down. But the, the, the benefit of ROS2 is that it was, is that you could at least trim it down. With ROS1, that was just, it was just, untenable like you couldn't even consider it but now you can't gotcha. like it's 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 much more it's modular. A technically possible thing to build you know flight capable control software that uses ROS 2 as a as a messaging pass as a message passion framework for example and then so you guys are migrating your clear path um ro ro you primarily run your clear path robots with ROS 1 correct um, yeah all the all the all the custom software we do is ROS 1 right now is ROS 1 any so and you mentioned the autoware you guys are using ROS two. Sorry, sorry, autoware as in the so for autoware as in the community initiative we don't use that. Oh. Um, what I was referring to was the autonomous code that our auto O T T O uh. autonomous mobile robots use. Um, gotcha. So that's like everything there is remains you know ROS one for the time being. Um, mm -hmm. I believe we have will be will start supporting ROS two. Uh, we'll start supporting ROS two on some research platforms in the near future. But since I don't have the schedule up in front of me, I'm not going to I'm not going to actually say those dates uh, <laughs> because I like to uh, support my engineering team. The um, <laughs> the yeah, I don't have a Twitter account where I just I just randomly name things. Last time, um, yeah. On the on the the side of our of our autonomy software. We use ROS2 for comms, and we're starting. We are starting to consider the uh, the migration process. We just finished the Python three migration, so next up is the ROS1 to ROS2 migration. But as you can imagine, um, as you can imagine, when you have several dozen software engineers writing code, and you know, and this code is also all going out to um, to factories, you we can't stop everything and just do a migration of yep. you know five to existing ten existing business of, continues of, for of, sure. <laughs> of uh, engineering. Oh, so yeah. we've been talking with a lot of that stuff. If we, and of course, if we find any, you know, shortcuts along the way, we'll, we'll definitely be short sharing them with the community because I'm sure there's other people in our, in our situation. situation. For sure. Are you getting um, comments from customers or uh, people that are coming to you? Are they asking for Ross too? Or how's the community? It's becoming more and more this? common. Yeah. It's becoming more and more common. I can say, from I can say from generally looking at from generally looking at 
you know, the interest at RossCon, there's a lot of people developing in Ross 2 right now. Um, and they're developing, you know, very real, very serious things in Ross 2. Um, we're, and we're definitely getting interest with ours. Uh, you know, for example, you know, one of the very things which is ROS2, uh, which is very clearly ROS2, is that if you are going to interact the, the API to our indoor autonomy software, for example, which is what runs all of our industrial self-driving vehicles, our industrial mobile robots, that's all ROS2. That's, that's the API. So if, if you want to go and talk to one of our, uh, talk to one of our autos, ROS2 is your only option. Gotcha. Now, let's see, we're, I, I would love to talk about some other things, but um, seeing that we don't have that much time left, if we're trying to hit an hour, um, I would love to ask you some kind of larger questions and get your perspective on a few things. Of course. Uh, so the first, you were saying you caught um, the wave of robotics, really, and you guys have stayed on top of it now. Um, and also, it seems to me from talking now, you guys also caught the open source wave, which is really exciting uh, to be on both of those. Like just you invested in open source and the community and the amount of code out there and the quality of code has just grown and grown. How would you, or what advice would you give to a startup that is looking to do a hardware robotic startup and they're just beginning now and they don't have all this infrastructure or expertise? So the first, the first bit of advice I'd give is to not, is to know what you want, know what value you're bringing to the world and partner as much as possible around that value. And what that means is when we started our auto division, we had to build the robots from scratch. We had to build the autonomy from scratch, the fleet manager, the UI, all of our continuous integration systems. We did a bunch of like internal upgrades to like gazebo to make it fit in continuous integration systems, like control software, like all of this stuff. We did all that from scratch, but now you can basically partner or buy a lot of that stuff off the shelf. Um, and I would really encourage any new startup in robotics to start with that and to not try to build everything from scratch, have a very good idea of what they're bringing to the table. And if I look at a, um, yeah, if, if I look at the way, you know, a typical startup, you're either bringing a new technology to an existing market um, or you're bringing a new market or you're, you have, you're taking an existing technology and applying it to a new market. Right? So, you know, the Airbnb and the Uber, for example, like they were bringing, they were, they had a market hypothesis and they were bringing some, some pretty standard technology there. Like at the time, everyone had smartphones. Um, and obviously we all still have smartphones. But us, we had we had a, a newer technology which was being brought to an existing market, which was materials handling, right? And I'm using the auto example here. Um, and the, but you want to pick one, right? So uh, are you, and these days there's just so much technology out there. And really, I think a lot of the opportunity is all these new markets where you can apply robotics. Ooh, yeah. And, and that means not inventing the wheel along the way. And you know, part of this, I, we spent a ton of time earlier on in this conversation talking about the ways that, that ClearPath engages with people. So obviously we can support those, those sorts of customers. We've supported startups along the way. If, and, and you know what, if, if they're working with us and then the startup turns around and says, you know what, I've got an order for a thousand um, and we're gonna go and outsource that stuff to let's say Jable, for example, and because they're gonna give us the best deal, Hey, that's cool. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you're succeeding. Right. But <laughs> there are companies like us, and then there's all sorts of off the shelf technology out there as well that can help you along the way. So that would be the, the real thing I'd say to those new robotic startups. Like don't try to do all the hardware and all the autonomy and all the fleet management and all the infrastructure. Use just, what you can. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah. Use what you can. Like I, I have, I have, spent those budgets, I know how much it costs and I know <laughs> yeah. I know the stresses that it brings you and it's it's not worth it. There's other ways to do it now at least. What do you think about this idea as like platform as a service or something like this for a business model? And what I mean by that would be um, if I am a robotics company, I'm going to buy someone else's robot, put my own code on it and then have it do something useful. Do you think that'll be a reasonable business model in the future? for robotics startups? 
like basically, so which, sorry, which side is the startup on or and are they on the side of writing the app? Yes. Basically an app. For yeah, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be the case. Um, I think early on, it's going to be a combination of the app and some tooling. Um, not perhaps not as complex as the robot, but uh, you're going to get the combination of the app and the tooling. But I, I definitely think that's going to be the case. And we've seen this actually um, through the through the recent you know year and a half. We've seen a lot of companies with no robotics expertise whatsoever been able to build disinfection applications, right? And that's what they've done, right? Is they built a new application, they built a new application, um, they built some hardware, they've stuck it on a robot, and they're good. So. Yeah, it's it's huge. I think I think right. At, I think for now you're going to see it as you're not going to necessarily see app like just someone who writes apps and makes money off the it's apps app right plus now. Tooling. I think, I, or or well, so even the app plus tooling. I think there's still going to be like app plus tooling plus you know a sales effort on its own, right? Like you're if you're selling if you make a disinfection robot, okay, you've done the app, you've built the hardware, and then you're going and you're going to sell it. Right. So I don't think we're yet as disintermediated, disintermediated as Apple, Apple is, for example, where they also bring you the customers. Um, but I definitely think that the time for getting a robot off the shelf and just putting like and just talking to its API and throwing some tools on it, that time is now. Like, I think that is now. Um, two years ago, it wasn't then, but, but in the last year or so, I think we're over that tipping point, which is really exciting. I mean, I would. I, there's, you're still, there's still going to be lacking in the the caveat. There is not every space, right? Like, there's no autonomy out there which can take like you know a a 100 kilo robot and run it around children safely, right? Like, that's not an off the shelf tool yet. But around a factory, around a mine, no, you can do that right now. That's awesome. Um, so you're saying like two years ago it wasn't the case that we could do this. Now it seems to be good. Where do you think it's going kind of projecting out, um, say the next two years, next five years, 10 years, whatever it might be? Where do you think the community is going? Well, I think in general, I mean, I think in general, it's, this is funny because I actually ask a very similar question when I interview people for work, <laughs> like for, for jobs at our company. So now it's the tables have turned. <laughs> I, think, I think in two years, we're definitely going to see areas, specific markets like, we'll use ours, for example, factories, where putting robots in or mobile robots in or collaborate robots in is going to be a pure business decision. Um, we have already seen this now where people have stopped asking us to prove that the localization is going to work, for example, right? Like we either say the localization works and it does, or we say that it's probably not going to work and we won't sell them or we won't try to sell it, right? Like that's... But more and more, it's going to be the same calculation of, you know, it's it's you know, just like um, it's it's just going to be a business decision, right? Like robots are just going to be something pragmatic. else you can buy off the shelf. Yeah, yep. just purely pragmatic. Um, which, to a lesser extent, it, it, it's kind of that way with robot arms still. But in both cases, the other thing that makes that possible is the significant decrease in integration time and cost and. Robot arms will still have a little bit of a, a challenge there, although many companies are starting to are starting to um, work around that. But you're going to see very low integration times, and because of that, it's it's going to be a lot more commodity like to just put some robots out in the out in the world. Um, the five years, I mean, five years, I think we're really going to start to see robots in earnest within the general public. Again, maybe not at you know maybe not in the daycare, but <laughs> you are going to see them out in earnest in the general public doing useful things. So I don't mean science for projects. I don't mean little things like that. And I, I know that there are various trials. There are various trials of delivery robots and things like this. But I, th I think it'll be a, they'll be much more pervasive, um, be much, much more pervasive. And we will be able to say that in certain cases and Probably not on-road self-driving, sorry to say, but in certain <laughs> cases, the safety story is effectively solved. Um, mm -hmm. I think we'll be able to say that. And awesome. when you're there, you know, what that means is over the, that two to five year time frame, that's where the real app, like that, you know, the ecosystem becomes really powerful because 
you know, now we're at the point where you could write apps for our robots in a factory right now. Like first you need to get into the factory, but you could write it right now. Um, and, but now, you know, two years, five years from now, they're really going to be in front of everybody. So you'll be able to, to script against one of those robots just as, as much as everything else. And maybe what I'll say is people might look at this and say, well, you know, why are we saying this now? Right? Like, didn't people say this 10 years ago and 20 years ago and whatever? And like, absolutely they did. Right? Like there was a glut of robot app store companies, um, you know, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, roughly, um, around the time of the TurtleBot one launch. And then there was, you know, Microsoft heavily investing in robotics with Microsoft Robotics Studio. And that was like, that was the 2000s, I think that was. But one of the things that's happening now is that all of those apps couldn't rely on safe, reliable autonomy. And now mm. you can and so I the think bedrock that is, is solved kind of thing. That's the, that's the bedrock, or right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't, you need to have a target, which is useful, like a, a device target, which is useful. And now uh, that didn't used to be the case, right? Like when these app stores started, started up, you're just kind of assuming that a bunch of people on their own were each going to come up with safe, reliable autonomy. And that's, that's hard when you're moving, you know, hundreds of kilos around. But now, now, no, I think we're, we're in a much better place. Like that autonomy is, well, I have, you know, many million reasons, uh, many <laughs> million hours of operation to say mm -hmm. that this is possible, right? Mm -hmm. That is exciting. Um, so wrapping up, do you have any, uh, do, you, do you have a Twitter or how can people find you or any, any public links you'd like to share or anything? They can find me on LinkedIn. I unfortunately do not. I am not part of the uh, the, the Twitter, the Twitter. Or speak, whatever, <laughs> whatever whatever it's being called. I, yeah, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. But they can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, in my email, which which will be needed to connect, is a uh, Ryan at ClearPath.ai. So they can also find me on that email. But LinkedIn would be preferred, I believe. Awesome. Okay, I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all we have for you today. I enjoyed Ryan's answer to where he thinks robotics will be in two to five years. Where do you think robotics will be in two to five years? Let us know in the comments on sensingact.com or Discourse. Thank you again to Open Robotics for being our founding sponsor. Bye, everyone.